Good morning and welcome to another day in Kuala Lumpur. Today is kind of a uh, shopping day for me. I have a whole bunch of uh, things I need in my life these days. And my main stop for today is a camera store in a part of Kuala Lumpur called Pudu. I don't know a lot about Pudu, but I do know it's a historic section of Kuala Lumpur. It's been around since the founding days of the city, and it has a bit more of a traditional air to it than the areas I've been to lately, like with all the fancy shopping malls and things like that. <clears throat> so it might be kind of interesting to see the streets of uh, Pudu. And to get there, of course, I'm taking the LRT to Pudu Station, and I'll be going on a line that I haven't uh, been on for a long time, and I haven't shot any video on that line. An interesting thing, though, is I have to transfer from the Kalana Jaya line to this one at Masjid Jamek Station, and I get turned around and confused every time I try to do this. I don't know what it is, but there's something weird about the way you transfer from one station to the other, and I always end up on the wrong platform, in the wrong train, going in the wrong direction. I don't know how I do it, but I do it every single time. Anyway, let's go see if I can make it to uh, Pudu Station without mishap this time. So this is what's going on today. There is Pudu Station, where I want to go, and I'm heading to Masjid Jamek Station, where I'll be transferring to either the Ampang Line or the Putra Heights Line. This line has confused me a number of times in the past, because I've had to go to places like this, for example, Bandar Tun Razak, and you can get on the line here, you get to Chan So Lin, and suddenly you're heading towards Ampang because you got on the wrong train, and then you have to get out here and change trains. So you gotta keep an eye on which train you're getting on. Since I'm going to Pudu, it doesn't matter. I can get on any train I want, but there's something about the transfer here that confuses me each time. We'll see whether I can figure it out. I just have to make sure I'm heading towards the Ampang or Putra Heights side of the platform. Pudu Station is not that far away, by the way. I could walk there if I wanted to, and I have in the past, but it's a bit hot today, so that's why I'm taking the LRT. I lost the lottery today because on the sign, it says that there's a two-coach train coming, not a four-coach. I still might try to take it if it's not too crowded. I only have to go one stop. I think I'll give this one a miss. I'm in not. Uh, I'm not in a hurry. That's a bit too crowded for me. Actually, I could have gotten on that train. It wasn't that bad. But I've gotten caught in the past where there's just enough room for me to get on and be comfortable. Then I get on, and then the train sits there for 30 or 40 seconds, and 20 more people come running up and get on, and then suddenly it becomes more crowded. So I've learned. I've learned to be careful. And like I said, no hurry. The four coach train is next, and here it comes. On our way to Masjid Jamek. We've arrived at Masjid Jamek, and now we just have to do the uh, transfer that I was talking about. But I think I've got it under control this time. I've been studying the maps. I think that is one reason I often get confused. It's because when you look at the map, it goes to Putra Heights, but they don't call it Putra Heights, they call it Sri Petaling Line. So that has confused me in the past. And here's the key moment, I guess. You can either go left to go to Ampang and Sri Petaling, or right to head to Sentil Timur. When you get to this point, suddenly the sign changes to Putra Heights and Ampang, 
but then when you start to follow the directions, look at the next sign, suddenly it changes back to Sri Petaling. So then at this point I'm often uh, confused. And here comes my train. It's a totally different looking kind of train too than the LRT and the MRT trains. It's got this squared off kind of, kind of looks like a Lego train to me, if that makes any sense. still part of the rapid KL system. And there's the point I was talking about where the two lines split. And we are here, that's where we got on Masjid Jamek. Three stops to Pudu, so we get off before we hit that point. station. And that's not my train. My train is right over here. Just leaving. When I was on that train, I realized I wasn't sure what to call it. Because, based on my experience so far, it doesn't look like an LRT, and it doesn't look like an MRT, so what is it? I saw on the inside there was a sign that said LRT, but it had, the train itself looks totally different from the other LRT lines I've been on. Mystery here to be solved. I think I have a confession to make. In a previous video I said that I only have two shirts. That brown and yellow one with the collar and the blue t-shirt. But as you can tell, I'm now wearing an orange shirt. So in fact, I have three shirts with me. But this one is kind of a cycling shirt. I usually only wear it when I'm riding my bike for some reason. Maybe the bright orange color. I think drivers can see me better. Anyway, my other shirts are uh, kind of dirty right now, so I broke out my orange cycling shirt for today. Welcome to Pudu. And my first challenge, as always, is to get across a busy street. But I think there's a couple of pedestrian bridges here I can take advantage of once we get... Once we get to the main street, we can take a look around and see what can be done. Ah, there we are, right over there. Pedestrian bridge. Otherwise, yeah, you're not getting across this unless you want to climb over that fence. As I said, I don't know much about Pudu, but I know that there's a large jail here, the Pudu Jail, and one of the largest wet markets in Kuala Lumpur is located here, the Pudu Market. I've never been there, so I might uh, check that out someday. But today is all about the camera store. I don't know if I mentioned it, but the camera store I'm going to is called YL Camera Services. And I'm a little bit nervous about going there because it's kind of a pro shop and your experience in terms of customer service can be hit or miss. I've had great customer service there in the past and other times just been completely ignored. They have this atmosphere of uh, dealing with professionals all the time and they all just kind of hang out. It's not like going to a shopping mall. Man, this is quite the uh, pedestrian bridge. Some serious uh, 
<laughs> metal design architecture here. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've been here a few times to Pudu, and I always leave with the sense that this is kind of a, a rougher part of town, you know, it's got harder edges than other parts of Kuala Lumpur. I don't know why I get that impression, but I do. And the reason I'm going to this camera store is I want to test a camera. Uh, this won't be of interest to anyone but camera geeks, but I have the Olympus OMD EM5, the original one, which came out in 2012, a long time ago. And it's broken, half the features don't work anymore, and I want to upgrade and I want to test the OMD EM5 Mark II to see how it works with audio in particular. So I want to plug in an external microphone and see what the sound is like. Um, I haven't been able to get any information about that online because nobody, nobody else uses this camera except me, apparently. Man, things sure change fast in cities. I swear the last time I was here, because the camera store is in this mall there on the corner, and the last time I was here, I swear that building didn't exist. It was not there. So in between my last visit and today, that entire skyscraper was built. The, I think it's the TRX exchange building. Amazing looking thing. There are all kinds of these uh, great traditional corner restaurants in this part of town. street side dishwashing. You always get the older men hanging out in those places. They look like they've been sitting there for, for years, literally, chatting with their friends, drinking tea. And uh, we got a dead rat over here, keeping life interesting. Kind of a typical, what I think of as a typical poodoo alleyway. As I said, it just feels like a rougher part of town for some reason. But it's certainly interesting. Now these restaurants fascinate me. But I've never really mastered them. What's interesting is that they have so many different cooking stations. So here they make these dishes, here they make a different dish, there they make a different dish, at this one a different dish. And they have so many cooking stations, and yet it's all part of one restaurant, I think. But as a foreigner, as a tourist, when I go into a place like this and sit down, I have no idea what to do. I mean, do you sit at a table and wait for someone to serve you? Good morning. Yeah, I just don't know. I think you have to know what you want before you go in, and you go and order at one of those counters, but then how you pay, how you do anything is always a bit of a mystery to me. I've gone there with friends, and they've sort of done everything for me, but on my own, it's always a bit of a challenge to figure it out. I think this is the Pudu Plaza, and my uh, camera store is in there somewhere. And as you can see, it's quite a different look from the shopping malls I've been in lately. Oh, look at that. I picked the right door. YL Camera, right there. I don't remember them having that uh, entrance before. Oh, I think that's the gadgets part of the store. Oh. Look at that. We have a Casio watch store, so I might have to check that out too. Well, let's head into this part of YL. Wow, the whole place has been uh, completely redesigned. This used to be two separate stores, right? And now you put it together into one. My 
trip to Pudu has ended in a mixture of success and failure. On the camera side, total failure. Everything I was worried about, the uh, like the poor customer service at uh, YL Camera Services, came true. It was like the worst customer service I've ever seen. The guys just look at their phone the entire time. They don't answer any questions. They don't do anything. They just sort of stand there and stare at you. I, I really don't know what that's all about. And uh, but I did manage to test one camera, the new version of this camera. And it's a far superior camera in every way to this one. And uh, I tested the microphone on it, but it was really hard to figure out whether it was working or not. And uh, I probably won't be able to tell till I bring it, the files home to my computer, listen to the audio on my computer, and then see what it sounds like. But even worse, as I was testing the camera, I found out that the continuous autofocus didn't work. Like, it didn't work at all. I would aim it at different things in the store, aim it at my hand, change uh, objects, and nothing ever changed. When I was shooting video actively, then autofocus would kick in. But as soon as I turned off the video recording or switched to taking pictures in continuous autofocus, nothing. It wouldn't focus on anything at all. It would only focus when I pushed the shutter button. And I was a little bit confused about that. I, I'm not that familiar with this new version of this camera. I was wondering whether that was normal behavior, like maybe that's the way this camera works. It doesn't make any sense to me that it would work that way, but I thought maybe. So I tried to ask the guys at the shop, you know, the clerks, you know, do you know about this camera? Um, is this how it's supposed to work? I think the autofocus is broken, I told them. And he just looked at me and said, yes. And that was it. So <laughs> that was the end of that. I finished testing it and um, put everything away and I handed the camera back to him and I told him pretty clearly that I think this camera is broken. The continuous autofocus doesn't work on this camera. And he just said yes, took the camera and put it back on the shelf and walked away. And that was the, uh, the end of my uh, time at YL Camera. Horrible place. I, I don't understand why uh, they operate that way. I really don't. It's been like that every time I've been to that camera store. And yet it's clearly a professional shop and they stock everything. So it'd be nice if the guys there were a bit more helpful. Just a little bit, you know, but they're uh, not helpful at all. <laughs> but now we get to the success part of my visit to Pudu. Because when I first went into the plaza, I noticed that little. Uh, watch shop and they had some Casio G-Shock watches in the front and I thought maybe just maybe they would have the basic simple line in the back and ta-da they did they had a whole range of exactly the watch I was looking for in fact other than this one being green and my old one having a blue box it's exactly the same as my old trusty Casio so my mission to buy a watch is, has been successful. <laughs> my mission to buy a camera, that continues. It is almost lunchtime, and I'm wondering whether I should try my luck at one of these places. See if I can uh, get something to eat. Right in front of me is the Fat Key Roasted Duck and Chicken Rice Stall. And I think I will give that a try. It looks like a friendly place. They even have their own waterfall <laughs> going on at the front. I'm sure that's not supposed to be that way. Let's see if we can get some uh, chicken rice. So I took a seat at uh, Fat Key, and uh, I don't know what I ordered, to be honest. They had to find the woman here who spoke enough English to deal with me. And she actually brought a tablet to the table and placed an order through the tablet. So despite this being or looking like a fairly rustic place, it's all uh, quite modern and high tech. And I was just going to order chicken rice, but she kept saying something about, she was suggesting something else. And my go-to strategy in those situations is just to say yes. Whatever's easiest, if they suggest something and they're gonna bring it to my table, I just say yes and uh, see what happens. And I ordered uh, iced tea. There they are, the old and the new. You can hardly tell which is which. But that's my old one. And 
and my new Casio. The main difference, or the main problem with the old one, is that I can't change anything anymore. It still works fine, but I can't push any of these buttons to change the date or change the time. So that's why I can't use it anymore. And there's my new one. Ta-da! There it is, in all its glory, my new Casio. Oh, it cost um, 70 ringgit. Exactly, 70 ringgit. So there's my meal. Now I understand what she was saying. I was ordering uh, chicken rice, and she was running through the whole list, like chicken, duck, pork, and something else. And I guess she was saying that better for one person would be to have a mix of all of them. So we got rice and a meat extravaganza. I am the last person to be reviewing food, since I don't know anything about food, but all of this is absolutely delicious. I don't know what this is or what you would call it, but... Uh, that is melt in your mouth fantastic. It's kind of a sweet coating on the outside. It's very tasty. I believe some kind of pork, but I can't be sure about that. Wow. That is so good. I like my um, strategy of letting the waitress order for me because I've mentioned before, I have the knack of finding the worst place to stand in a restaurant. I always sit at the worst table, and I always order the worst thing on the menu. I don't know how I do it, but I always do. So if the waitress makes a suggestion, it's always better than what I would have ordered for myself. So I just say, bring it, and <laughs> bring it to the table. And this is very good. some kind. Very good, I'm sure. Oh, so good. So, that was lunch for today, and uh, that meal made the whole trip to Pudu worthwhile. Uh, here's a sign for uh, where I had my meal. The Fat Key Roast Duck and Chicken Restaurant, since 1988. And while I was eating, I saw a, a menu on the wall there. It has English. And uh, now I understand what was going on. You can order chicken, or you can order duck, or barbecue pork, or crispy pork. But then they also have all combo, where you get all four of them. Chicken, duck, barbecue pork, and crispy pork in one plate. And uh, you can get it for two person, or three person, or I guess for one person, and that's what I got. And uh, I got iced tea as well. And the whole meal came to uh, 18 ringgit. And best of all, the service was fantastic. The woman was very friendly, very helpful. Um, food was great. All A plus all around for my my lunch experience in uh, Pudu. And that's where all the uh, cooking takes place in there. One interesting thing about these restaurants I've noticed is that the food can be amazing. They will even have uh, newspaper articles like this one about the food, how good it is. You know, kind of demonstrating that it's a bit of a famous restaurant. But despite all that, they'll still have plastic stools, plastic chairs. What I was getting at about the restaurants like that is that even though they have a really good food, an amazing reputation, they will still try to make it look like a low-budget restaurant. And someone explained it to me, a woman who runs a restaurant here that I know, she used to have a restaurant like that, a very well-known, very famous place for beef noodle soup. And then she moved from that into a nicer spot, you know, more like a, re a restaurant, cafe style. 
and she found her customers didn't want to go there. Same food, same price, nothing had changed, but now because of the decor, people thought it was too expensive. It just looked like an expensive restaurant, so they didn't want to go there anymore. So they've learned that uh, with restaurants like that, serve amazing food, have a really good reputation, but keep the decor quite plasticky and simple so everybody thinks they're getting a really good price on their meal. I was thinking about that because it feels very different from what I would experience in Canada, where if I went to a restaurant and had really nice seats, nice tables, beautiful decor, I would recommend it to all my friends and say, wow, you gotta go to this restaurant, it's a great place. But here, it might be the opposite. All this great decor, comfortable chairs, air conditioning, and you tell your friends, ah, don't go there, it's, it's too expensive. So it's kind of an opposite uh, way of thinking. A, a foodie or a professional restaurant reviewer might have a system like giving a restaurant one star, two star, or four stars, something like that. But my system is much simpler. I only ask one question about a restaurant or a coffee shop or anything like that, or a camera store. Would I go back there again? And for this place, absolutely, I would go back there again. I'd go back any day of the week. Would I ever go back to YL Camera? No, I absolutely would not. I would try very hard not to go back and uh, buy my camera equipment somewhere else for sure. I don't want to give Kuala Lumpur too much of a hard time, but I, I can't resist pointing this out. Here we've got this very busy street. You can't cross it, even if you wanted to, because there's a big fence in the middle. So this walkway is the only way to cross over this street for a pedestrian. And here on the sidewalk, there is no way to get to the pedestrian bridge. You literally can't get there. I mean, you walk towards the pedestrian bridge, here it is, and then you get to this point, and there's just a giant fence. <laughs> and there's no, there's no way to get there. You actually have to go back. I thought I could come over here and go back to the pedestrian bridge, but then you have to go through this uh, private parking lot for taxis, which they probably don't want you to do, but I'm going to anyway. And this is the only way to somehow fight your way over to there where you get onto the pedestrian bridge. So, <laughs> this is not a, a friendly city for us poor pedestrians. Designed for drivers, built for drivers. If you don't have a car, ah, that's your fault. And I finally found it. The entrance to the pedestrian bridge. And this, uh, this pedestrian bridge kind of cracks me up anyway. I really feel like I'm in prison right now. This is like a, <laughs> a nasty looking uh, pedestrian bridge. Man. And there's uh, the real story of Kuala Lumpur. All that construction. Construction towers everywhere. Now the designers managed to do a slightly better job on this side of the street anyway. Because the entrance and the exit really is right on the uh, sidewalk, so that makes sense. Another thought that I had while buying the watch was about the, the different styles of marking prices here in Asia as compared to, say, back in Canada. When I went into the watch store, they had prices on all the watches, of course, and mine had a price tag of 79 ringgit on it. And then when I finally decided which one I wanted and I told the guy I will buy this one, he took it away and then he turned to me with a big smile and he said, well, discount, discount for you, 70 ringgit. So, which I always find kind of amusing because I know the real price always was 70 ringgit or probably 50 or 60 ringgit. I know the real price wasn't 79. I know he isn't giving me a real discount. You know, I'm not a dummy. But we have to go through this whole charade pretending like 79 ringgit was the real price and he gave me a discount because he liked me, you know? And that always strikes me as funny because 
in the West, of course, the price is the price. They put the price on it, that's the price. But here, the price is never quite the price. You never quite know what's going on with the price. Perfect timing. <clears throat> I just arrived at the platform and my train is arriving. Adventures are over, a success and a failure. The success, of course, is right here on my wrist, my brand new Casio. Hopefully I don't have to shop for a new watch for another 10 years. Total failure as far as uh, camera stores was concerned, but the hunt goes on and a uh, bit of a jumbly morning, a lot of different experiences, but I'll end the video there and I'll see you in the next one. The bonus question for the last video was about the Patronus Towers. I asked you, how long does it take the executive elevators to travel all the way from the basement car park to the top of the towers? A. 60 seconds B. 90 seconds C. 2 minutes or D. Just 20 seconds The answer is B. 90 seconds. At least that's the answer according to the official Patronus Towers website. Bonus question for this video. This question is for all my fellow camera geeks out there. I use an Olympus OMD EM5 camera and it has a special sensor. My question is what is so special about the sensor that this Olympus camera uses? And what makes it different? Put your answer in the comments below. Answer at the end of the next video. Now it works. When I'm recording. Travel tip 27. Use mood music at historical sites. This is something I learned long, long ago. I would visit a famous historical site and I would be so distracted by the hundreds of other people visiting, by the uh, people selling things, souvenir stalls, bus tours going through, all this kind of stuff, that I would be so distracted that I wouldn't be able to appreciate the place fully. Then one day I happened to have my Sony Walkman with me. Yes, this was a very long time ago, and I had a cassette tape of the soundtrack for the movie The Killing Fields. Uh, Mike Oldfield did the music for that movie, and it's very atmospheric and very dramatic. Anyway, I was at Borobudur in uh, Indonesia, and there just happened to be uh, hundreds and hundreds of school children there that day on a field trip. And there were so many people and there was so much going on. I, I really wasn't in the mood to visit the place and, and I wasn't appreciating it. But then I popped in the cassette from the Killing Fields, put on my uh, earphone, my headphones, and suddenly all the people disappeared. 
all the distractions disappeared and the music created a perfect mood for being at the temple and it was like I was transported back in time a thousand years or more to when the temple was built. I ended up spending a couple of hours at Borobudur just wandering around lost in the music and lost in the atmosphere of the place. After that I always visited historical sites armed with some kind of music. I found that movie soundtracks worked the best because they were instrumental and often very dramatic but I would also pick up local music from the country I was in and play that, usually some kind of traditional music, and that would help a lot with uh, the atmosphere. I think about a place like Angkor Wat in Cambodia. My visit to Angkor Wat is one of the highlights of my time in Asia. It really was a spectacular place. But friends of mine have gone there, and they've come away completely unimpressed. They just thought it was a bunch of temples and a bunch of rocks and they really got nothing out of the experience. And after talking to them, it sounded like they were just distracted by the large bus tours, by the level of tourism that goes on at uh, Angkor Wat now. And there's so many people, like local people, selling you things now, souvenirs. And it's difficult to get in the right mood to appreciate the place. But if you've got some music on your smartphone, on an MP3 player, or maybe even on an ancient uh, Sony Walkman, start playing that music, pop in some earbuds, and all those distractions disappear, and you can lose yourself in the atmosphere of a place like uh, Angkor Wat. Music is really powerful, that's obvious, everyone knows that, and uh, music can be a powerful tool in the arsenal of a traveler. I'm back. There's just one more thing I wanted to say about music, and that is that music can be tied tightly with memory. Uh, I think scientists have even proved that, that some of the senses like smell and sound can really trigger memories. And I found that listening to music during certain experiences while you're traveling can really bring that experience back. Uh, again, thinking about my travels in Indonesia, I remember one time going on a long bus journey through a beautiful part of uh, Java, and I happened to be listening to uh, an album by Midnight Oil, uh, Diesel and Dust, I think was the name of the album. And now, every time I hear a song from that album, that whole experience of traveling through Java just comes flooding back. It's really quite an incredible thing. So listening to music in different countries almost gives you a soundtrack of your own for that country. Yeah, try it. You might be surprised at uh, how much your memory of a country gets tied to the music that you listen to while you're there.